As Mari said, I came to talk about this book, um, Mighty and Turbulent uh, Continent World Future for Europe. Not that I'm here to promote it or anything, but um, Alan Bennett tells quite a good story about promoting his books. He was walking past a bookstore in Oxford and he saw this book, this bookstore with piles of his book in the window and he went in and said, you know, I'm happy to sign these. And the, the woman selling them looked completely shocked and said, don't do that, we have enough trouble selling them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we, just, we were having a little discussion at lunchtime and, you know, I was saying I was a bit fed up with talking about the euro and all of that. It, of which there's quite a lot in this book. So uh, I'd like to do something a bit more adventurous for you today and hope that you will bear with me. So I'm going to talk partly about this book, but what I'd like to talk about is the convergence of two projects, really. This book on the future of Europe, but another book that I'm writing, um, which I'm some way through, but doesn't have this form or shape as yet which has a somewhat uh, sort of pretentious title. It's called Off the Edge of History, the World in the 21st Century. Uh, by, by off the edge of history, I mean that we're, we're living in a world in which many of the opportunities and the challenges we face have never been experienced by previous civilizations. They have been created by the advent of the modern industrial order and by the emergence of the digital world which is reshaping it all before our very eyes at the moment. And I want to propose to you that we're in the middle of probably the biggest series of technological changes ever in human history, certainly in terms of their speed and their global nature. One way of understanding this is to compare the advent of the internet with the invention of writing. There are analogues between those, I think, because writing made possible the early civilizations. I also wrote a book on that once. Um, but writing took 10,000 years to become diffused, even to small elites in a relatively small number of civilizations. The internet is only 20 years old, and it's completely transformed our lives on a global as well as on a personal level, because when you get out your mobile phone, it's a device which is about your personal life at the same time as it's a means of global communication. Mobile phones as computers are only something like 10 to 12 years old, and now there are more mobile phones in the world than there are people. Not everybody has one, but that, that uh, border was passed about two months ago, when calculated anyway, more mobile phones in the world than people. This is stupendous stuff. So I think we're, we're like living along the edge of a wave of technological innovation and other kinds of social and economic innovation which follow from it, which if we don't insert into the European debate is not going to allow us to understand it properly. That would be my argument anyway. I think we're like frontiers people in 18th century America really against a frontier of a surge of massive scientific and technological innovation. I'm on a committee in the House of Lords for studying the digital world, and we've uh, had representations from many different companies, individuals, scientists, thinkers. It is just mind-blowing what is happening. And I will portray what's happening as like a completely new mixture of risk and opportunity such as we've never had to disentangle before. So on the, the, on the one hand, you have risks associated with climate change that I mentioned earlier, which simply have no precedent in prior civilizations. No civilization could have intervened in nature remotely to the degree to which ours has. Uh, many people will probably know that geologists have got a new word for this. They say we've entered the age of the Holocene, H-O-L-O-C-N-E, an age in which nature is no longer nature because it's been so completely penetrated by human activity, and I think this is correct. So we've penetrated massively into what used to be an independent external world. 
that constitutes a resource for us, but also posing us huge new risks, which we're nowhere near, in my view, adequately coping with. That's true of the outer world. This is also happening in the inner world. One of the things that's really impressed me, taking the evidence on this committee, is the degree to which we're now penetrating the human mind and the human body on a level, again, never, ever even contemplated before, I think. And there are some very interesting thinkers who are working on this. I don't know if people here know Ray Kurzweil, um, whether you know the debate on singularity. The debate on singularity is a debate about the point at which we will cease to be authentic human beings or we'll be so different that we won't any longer be, as it were, human beings. And uh, Ray Kurzweil wrote this book called The Singularity is Near, in which he argues that there is the possibility of immortality within 40 years so that younger people who are alive today uh, might be immortal. <coughs> immortality would mean not what you just think immediately of a preserved body. It would be a very different way of, for example, if you could download the brain on a computer and you could clone bodies, you could live for as long as you wanted in whatever guise you chose. Of course, no one knows. But the most, most important thing about it, the reason why I like Kurzweil is now, by the way, the technical director of Google, so he's got a kind of somewhat noxious, possibly practical impact on the world, because lots of things Google does that I don't really approve of, I must say. But nevertheless, he's, you know, he's an information scientist, so he's a serious person. But we just don't know. So part of my argument is also we're living in a kind of don't-know world because the pace is so, is so, change is so dramatic. Of course, you never knew the future, obviously. Logically, it's true. Karl Popper said, if we know the future, it wouldn't be the future not talking about that, I'm talking about the fact that we're in a world of truly turbulent change, very rapid and global, which is largely unprecedented. Therefore, that's the reason why I call it a high opportunity, high risk society. The opportunities are immense, but the risks are huge too. And we don't know in advance how those two sorts of things will be connected. So I wanted to argue to you that um, we have to understand what, try and assess the implications of what's happening inside the EU against the context of these broader global trends. If we don't do that, we might misunderstand both what's happening within the European Union countries and the remedies that are needed to address the issues that are raised. So I'm arguing that a good deal of the debate uh, about the European Union is too parochial. You can understand why it's so concerned with the euro, so concerned with Europe itself, but it's a mistake to make it too parochial, I think. And second, too institutional, too concerned with, for example, reform of political systems, very important, reform of the euro, very important, but that isn't necessarily going to address these lateral trends which are impinging on all societies across the world. So I, what I, I, I was ask, sort of asking you if you treat this speech a bit like a wine tasting, that is, I wanted to go through th four areas where I think this is interesting in respect to the current debates about the European Union. I won't be able to discuss any of those in the detail you would need to exhaustively examine them, but just to give a kind of taste of why I think we absolutely must understand our local problems in Europe against a much broader global background. And remember, when one talks about global, you're not talking just about there global, you're talking in here global, because what global means is now intimate connection between even the very um, core of the self and the larger global changes we're experiencing. So these are my four sort of substantive points which I'd like to raise and get your reactions to. First, it seems to me crucial to understand that populism is not confined to Europe, not at all. That the rise of populism in politics is part of a global trend. It therefore comes from wider structural sources than purely European ones. It's visible in the United States, it's visible in Latin America, 
visible in, in Australia. And it's going along with like a fragmentation of politics in many countries in which the established two-party systems are no longer viable and in which many other formerly fringe parties are becoming a poor core part of the political process, such a core part that they probably settle elections. This is likely to happen in the next British election where the reason no one can really predict it is you don't know what's going to happen around the edges both in terms of who votes and where, but also the array of smaller parties that um, will probably settle the issue in British politics. There's nothing British or European about this. This is happening more or less everywhere. It's worth discussing, and I won't have time to discuss in detail why this should be so. Why is populism becoming so prominent? Why is politics becoming fragmented in so many democratic countries anyway? Well, I, I think it's, it stems fundamentally, really, from the world I've been describing. That is, you have a hierarchical world of traditional politics and you have a new horizontal world of electronic and digital technology which completely cuts across it. And we have not found a way of effectively integrating those things in any kind of institutional fashion. Attempts like citizens' juries and referenda and so on haven't got very far to do that. So there's a kind of huge hole there in politics. And those things are overlapping with a, a failure of the developed economies to be able to redistribute wealth and income effectively. Many people in lower income groups are not seeing across the world any advance uh, in their living standards, even though there's talk of recovery everywhere and there is a substance, substance to that talk in quite a few uh, countries. And that connects also, I think, with the experience of deindustrialization. <clears throat> deindustrialization is deeply uh, involved with the rise of populist parties in almost all countries because of the groups that it affects. So you find some very interesting parallels between populists across the world. They're nearly all against the establishment. <clears throat> Being against the establishment forms part of the discourse. All this appears in the European populist parties. But my point would be that in Europe we must disentangle these generic from um, other local influences. So we mustn't assume that because the populist parties focus their attention on hostility to the European Union, that the European Union is the origin of the things that they're objecting to. <coughs> to me, the origins are deeper. And perversely, as a pro-European, only through a stronger Europe can you hope to have some impact on them. If Europe seriously became a cluster of nation states, you'd have far less chance of having an impact on some of these forces than you would if you can create unified European action. So I think pro-Europeans have to find a way of making that case effectively. We're dealing with huge forces here. They're not within control of the United Nations or any democratic system on an international level. We're seeing all this fall out and the uncertainty across the world at the moment, even talked by the Pope two days ago of the existence of a third world war, he says. It's a kind of low-grade World War III going on. So we mustn't too, be too parochial. We must sort out what's general and what is specific, and we must produce our remedies and our political strategies accordingly. I'm very happy to discuss that later. Second, there are absolutely sweeping changes affecting the economy on a global level. And it seems to me that, although it's quite right to say there is a cyclical element, obviously, following the crisis in um, the economic travails of Europe and the United States and other countries across the world, I would want to make the argument that the crisis is also structural and it, it can't be resolved purely by anti-cyclical measures, important they will be, because I completely buy the argument myself that we need renewed investment in Europe, we must bridge the gap between North and South. We were talking about lunchtime for this meeting. Germany must change its attitudes, otherwise the Europe could relapse into deep troubles. 
But when you look at what's happening on the ground in work, it is just transformational, I think. And it's dominated by uh, the digital revolution. So when in my House Laws Committee we started studying the digital economy, many of us thought the digital economy is one little bit of the wider economy. <coughs> but we rapidly came to see that the whole economy is becoming digital, just like the whole of our personal lives have become digital through the fact you wander around the street, you can't let go of your bloody mobile phone, you're lost if you lose your mobile phone, you've probably got an iPad at home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an amazing transformation in such a short period. And so I've been working, tracking some of these changes and what you have is like a convergence between the advent of supercomputers, um, robotics, and big data, which are transforming large chunks of economic life, also political life, and also warfare. Uh, the US has about 7,000 drones in the air every day. A drone is essentially a robot, uh, still a relatively primitive robot, but you're having these convergent uh, developments. So I don't know if anyone here has tracked the IBM computer Watson. Watson engaged in a TV <coughs> confrontation with the two champions at this game, Pergamon. You know, computers have long been out to meet, beat the world champions at chess, but chess is mathematical. Pergamon is a word game, general knowledge game. And the IBM computer beat the two world champions on three separate occasions at this game was never thought possible before. You go back 10 years and people were saying computers could never master natural language because natural language is embedded in reality, right? And the reality of the body and so on. And could never write poetry, could never do translation. But now you have supercomputers do very good, accurate natural language translations, are able to think creatively and can actually learn. This is a sort of huge thing for all of us. Linked to what Kurzweil is talking about, a potential transcendence of the human being, but deeply involved in the transformation of work, as is robotics, um, because robotics have, has advanced amazingly in, even in the last 10 years. I went to the Sony Media Lab, I think it was about 12 years ago, where they said the future is robotics, but their bloody robot couldn't do anything, couldn't even walk upstairs. Now you've got robots that can run faster than a human being, that can jump in the air, that can play soccer, that can do all sorts of, uh, well, many things better than human beings now. You've even, you'd be interested in, you know, got a robot stand-up comedian that <laughs> invents its own jokes and can respond to the audience in a creative way. I'll tell you one of its jokes, which I think is quite good, actually. Is this, I started going out with an Apple device, but it didn't really work, because she was always, I this, I that, I the other. <laughs> <laughs> quite good, I thought, really. And the truth is, this is, again, you know, a high-opportunity, high-risk scenario for us. Some calculations have been done by these guys in Oxford, Carl Frey and other people, that supercomputers could knock out 40% of existing professional jobs in the US economy. They did this by very detailed tracking of those jobs. They include legal jobs, scientific jobs, accountancy, and so forth. So it's possible that these developments could cut a swathe through existing uh, labor forces. But I, having looked at it in some detail myself, I tend to think not. I think that the opportunity side is pretty huge. And I think where it's very important for Europe is that it also is likely to produce a new localism. And I'm one of those who thinks that you, many people here might not share my opinion, but to me it's very important. We must counter deindustrialization. I think deindustrialization has been a lethal force in Western countries. And you can't simply allow it, if we can do anything about it, just to go on and get worse. So therefore, we must try to reconstruct manufacture against the background of these technological changes and the back, again, wider changes in the position of the Chinese economy and so on, where China should be investing in domestic demand, not just exporting to the rest of the world. So 
I take seriously at least the possibility of reindustrialization in Europe, and I've been tracking that debate in the United States. It's been going for now, quite controversial, but been going about sort of 15 years now. You have, for example, widespread development of digital production, 3D printing, which can be done anywhere, is just the outer edge, as I would see, as a much wider transformation towards digital production, much of which could be relocalized and from which everybody in the world economy would probably gain. So I was pleased that Mr. Juncker put high on his agenda the possibility of the reindustrialization of Europe. It's admittedly controversial, and it's against the backdrop we don't really know, but I think we have to take it seriously. It involves more than the forces I'm just describing, of course. It involves a kind of restructuring the world economy too. It involves the so-called reshoring debate and other things going on in the area. But I, just, I think if deindustrialization simply continues, I just don't see how we're going to address the socioeconomic issues that it brings in its train. So I think we have to make a serious attempt without fully knowing in what sense and where it will be possible. But a lot of these changes do seem to me to be positive, not just destructive. Third, and this comes back to what we were talking about lunchtime a bit, I think we need a radical rethinking of the European social model. And I'm just amazed how separate the debate about the future of Europe has been from this. You know, I get invited to a lot of conferences on European social model and quite a lot of conferences on the future of the euro, but it never seemed to come together. There seem to be different people working on them. Why is that? I think it's because of the separation which is kind of enshrined in people's minds and enshrined in European thinking, really, between economic and social policy and the kind of traditional idea of the welfare state whereby you know, the economy creates wealth and then the welfare state spends it on good purposes and does so through taxing the people who make the wealth. Well, that's surely an outdated way of thinking about it all. That's why I invented this term that was referred to as social investment state because I think we have to recognise that investment in social goods also has economic consequences and if you get it right this can be very significant for economic prosperity. In obvious cases, education, but there are many other areas where I think we should speak of a social investment state. In other words, you don't want to wait just to redistribute after wealth has been created. You want to build that into the very constitution of the economy by the investments you make. So an investment in education is not just an investment in improving people, it's also creating a certain kind of labor force. And one of the things that's happened again in this famous committee that I mentioned several times, House of Lords, is we've discovered just how poor the quality of um, training and uh, education relevant to living in a suddenly developing and universal digital age is sort of way behind. So I'm also glad that Mr. Juncker is talking about that and hope that I might have had some sort of marginal impact on it all. So, I think we have to have a pretty radical rethink of the European social model. And uh, part of that is a move towards treating it as a social investment state. The other, though, is to lock on to these technological transformations. And it, I think there is something very significant potentially going on here. I work in universities, and probably some other people do here. You'll know about the advent of mass open online courses. Well, those are um, uh, forms of of uh, courses carried online uh, where you can interact with uh, other people in a seminar group across the world. It's almost in real time, a bit like on Skype, as it were. You can see the other people. Those people might be anywhere in the world. At the moment, you don't pay anything for the course. In principle, these could reach many millions of people. Again, it's like a don't know future. Some people think this will seriously undermine campus-based universities. Other people think it might only have a marginal impact. But what's happening in universities is happening everywhere. So if we're really going to transform the medical system, if we're really going to transform prisons, there's probably got to be a fairly leading high-tech digital edge to it all. 
And I'd like to propose to you that what could happen is like a reversal of Foucault. I don't know how many people have studied Michel Foucault, but Michel Foucault pointed out late 18th century, you've got the invention of the workplace, you've got the invention of the school, you've got the invention of the prison, you've got the invention of the university, um, organizations situated in specific times and places were constructed about that period, he says, because you needed to discipline people in those places. While it's at least possible, we'll see a radical reversal of that, I think, over the next 10 to 20 years even, not over a long period, over potentially a short period, when these things could become, again, decentralized and decentered with the usual mix of risk and opportunities, but perhaps with the opportunities side being pretty huge because an enormous amount of medicine can now be done at distance. Enormous amount of treatment can be done by self-monitoring devices. If you have a pacemaker now, it um, can send information back to a surgeon or a hospital on a routine basis. You can see that some of these things could be noxious. Of course they could, but they might be fundamental part of the solution and how are we going to create a 21st century welfare system which deals with the problems of aging, which deals with the demographic problems that we have in such a way that we're not leaving people um, simply outside of the system and destitute. I'm not saying it will, I'm saying it's another don't know kind of universe, but the more you look at it, the more interesting it seems to me it is. So if you go to universities, I think we're certainly going to get a sort of mix, really, of MOOCs and traditional campus-based teaching. I think MOOCs are quite transformative, and they could track what happened to telephones in Africa. You know, in African countries, they bypass fixed telephone systems and in favour of mobiles and simply skip that stage. Well, the same thing could happen with university education, you probably will get amalgams of these systems. And since you're dealing with very rapid changes here, these are not just things for any kind of remote future. They're all kind of here and now things, at least in my opinion, where the advances are just stunning in some of them. Medicine. Supercomputers can now decode aspects of the genetic construction of the human body which no human being could ever have done before. Combine that with nanotechnology, you have just immense possibilities of medical treatment, way beyond anything we ever thought possible. And again, as a more or less here and now thing, I don't think as just a remote future thing. And the more detail you get into it, the more stunning it actually is. I'm not saying it doesn't have noxious consequences, it does. All of it is a massive tangle of risks and opportunities. My fourth point is. Um, the return of sectarian divisions, which is visible everywhere and is not, again, just a phenomenon in Europe. So you see the rise of nationalism, but um, also of other forms of closed idea systems. So the internet, which at first seemed to many people to be an intrinsic instrument of cosmopolitanism, turns out to have a very dark side indeed, I think which was not appreciated by its early pioneers and which we're only starting to discover the consequences of. So if you look at ISIS or IS, as it now calls itself, it's a quite extraordinary mix of the medieval and avant-garde because ISIS deploys the latest forms of information technology. It does most of its recruiting online. It has very sophisticated monitoring systems. It beheads people online, as everybody knows. It's quite extraordinary mixture, and therefore not just a return tradition, to tradition, I think. It's a, it's a kind of creation of the very world we're talking about, which is bringing into play a lot of dark forces as long as, as alongside the more liberating ones. And it, it, like everybody, probably many people here have been tracking Scottish referendum. I don't want to go straight from ISIS to Scotland, of course. <laughs> but... Um, and that's quite amazing. I found, I found that also mind-blowing because the Scottish referendum was just the opposite of a parochial event. It was being tracked everywhere. Not just by uh, separatist groups, which it was, but also by others too across the world. And you can read it all on the internet. You can see the Kurdish newspapers discussing it, um, newspapers in... Well, certainly Russian media, you know, use Scotland a lot when talking about Crimea. 
but it's actually a global thing. There's the same thing in um, Kashmir, and it's quite amazing. It could never have been possible before the advent of the internet, but it's, like, it's been like a complex global dialogue about it all. It, many, many separatist groups, of course, using it as a basis of their own legitimacy, and Catalonia in Europe is the next one along, as we all know, potentially followed by the Basque country, potentially followed by about six or seven other possible ones, but it is really global. And I, I must say, I never expected that, really. Mm. It just shows you the sort of intensity of globalization in the world in which we live. So my argument is that we have to therefore situate our own specific discussions in this broader context, otherwise we'll get the causes of them wrong and the possible remedies for them wrong. I want to conclude by saying that um, you know, this is a time at which Europe is more or less everywhere seen as problematic. I think if you, if you look at what the Chinese say about Europe or uh, certainly the Russians say about Europe or discussion of Europe, even Australia, it's unremittingly dismissive of the European Union. Look at some of Mr. Putin's speeches and see what he's been saying in Europe for quite a long while. Europe seems unable to generate effective economic growth, seems plagued by divisions, obviously with a populist tinge, and because of Russia has a sort of semi-active war going on on its periphery looks really disturbing. And yet, you know, having gone through it all, it just seems to me as a possibility that uh, Europe might be in a better position, not a worse position than the other major industrial countries in the world in coping with the world which is coming into being and even being uh, a leading factor in it. Because whatever else it is, Europe is a cosmopolitan endeavor it is the possibility of sh it does offer the possibility of shaping of shaping global forces i mean i have the opposite view of sovereignty from most people and most people say when you join the european union you sacrifice part of your sovereignty i think the opposite is true i call this sovereignty plus in my book you get more real sovereignty in an independent world from being part of the european union than you would ever get outside one shouldn't confuse formal sovereignty with real sovereignty in an interdependent world. And finally, an awful lot of reform has happened in the European economies, including some of the most problematic ones, admittedly not all of the problematic ones. But I think if you compare the European Union with the United States, the divisions between the poorest parts of Europe and the most affluent parts are actually less than they are between the poorer states and the more affluent states in, in America. And the level of reform has been lower, I think, in the United States in those areas. So I don't feel as pessimistic about it as one might do. And I think if we could somehow get our act together in Europe, Europe further, not succumb to divisiveness that there's a possibility that, that Europe could, in fact, even against this apparently disturbing situation in these three areas, again, represent something of a, a beacon to the rest of the world, not just a laggard. But this is the high opportunity, high risk society. We just don't know the future anymore, not in a logical sense, but in the sense in which you cannot know in advance how the balance of risk and opportunities will turn out. You must try and assess it and place political policy in such a way as to <coughs> confine the risks and accentuate the opportunities. But none of that is going to be easy, but I don't think Europe is in a worse position than the other industrialized parts of the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.